Welcome everybody and welcome to this particular presentation because tonight's show we have not only just a regular writer, we don't only ha we not only have a just a very uh, amazing writer, we have a legendary writer and we are really glad to have among us uh guess who? Chuck Dixon, legendary writer. How are you doing, Chuck? Hey, I'm doing great. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much for accepting the invitation. And uh, of course, let me allow me to introduce the rest of our merry gang. Uh, we have uh, in first uh, place uh, Daniel Villamil, El Guki. How are you doing, Guki? Hi. Good night. All right. And we have also El Psicotropico, the always precise. Hi. A uh, yeah, pleasure to have Chuck with us. Really, really a pleasure. And also the man who made this possible, or uh, talent uh, searcher or talent hunter, uh, Gilberto alias uh, Nightboy, how are you doing? Yeah, doing fine. Thank you very much, Chuck, for joining us. And thank you all of you to, to having, having us somewhere in the net. Uh, I don't know where this is transmitting, but uh, this is going to be an amazing show. Uh, we're certainly sure about that. And uh, first of all, as uh, we have all mentioned, Chuck, first of all, thanks for accepting this invitation, especially sure. because, well, uh, we were uh, doing some research just right before uh, when, when, when uh, we were preparing this show. And uh, we were actually wondering what characters have you not written because you have pretty much written <laughs> about everybody in any oh. universe. So is there somebody else uh, who, who perhaps hasn't been uh, touched by your pen? Your pencil? I, I, uh, I've never written any X-Men. Ah, okay. N oh. Never wanted to either. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so there's always a fear, so that 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 could be uh, uh, something in the future. Hickman, remember that if you want to to get in touch, uh, he's not the editor, but he's right now the head of X. However, something that you are writing and uh, it's a project that has been uh, developing uh, lately, and we are so glad because I believe that we are really close to to get this is a story. Let's also focus on some characters that come from the films. And you are actually writing this story. And I, uh, we are talking about The Expendables, Go to Hell, the graphic novel that you can actually find if you go to Indiegogo and you search like this, uh, The Expendables, Go to Hell. Uh, it's uh, co-written co uh, by Sylvester Stallone and Chuck Dixon and with the art of Graham Nolan. You are making a, a wonderful team. You have obviously uh, uh, worked with with with. Uh, uh, with Graham before in in a lot of comics and with Sylvester Stallone, uh, is this the first time that you are writing uh, with Sylvester, or have you worked with him before? I worked with him before on some um, some web content for Lionsgate Films. Um, it was a proposed animated series that he and I were going to do that never went anywhere, and then uh, he got me work doing uh, dialogue for an Expendables video game. So, uh, you know, I've worked with him before, but never directly on a story like we're doing here. Excellent. And can you tell us a little bit about how his experience? Because, well, obviously, uh, the Expendables are like uh, slice uh, babies because it's a franchise that he started. It's something that we love. I mean, it, it's not a coincidence that uh, the, the, the group of fans and followers of our show, uh, it's called the DS Army. And uh, we have some sort of the military aspects. I mean, we, we were wearing dog tags and I, I, I have my Expendables uh, ring. I, uh, it's oh, something that I always wear. So I wasn't prepared for this. Yeah, right. <laughs> 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 All right. So, can you tell us a little bit about the experience of uh, developing this particular project? Well, um, I, I had done an Expendables comic book uh, years ago before the first movie came out. I wrote a prequel comic, and uh, uh, Sly liked it. And he called me on the phone and uh, he asked me if I'd like to uh, help him with some rewrites on uh, Expendables 2, the first sequel. And, uh, and that didn't work out, but we, he stayed in contact. And uh, at one point, he and I were talking about Expendables 4, and he said that the movie he'd really like to make was called Expendables Go to Hell. And I said, well, what's that about? And he says, well, the Expendables die, they go to hell, and they fight the devil. Hmm. And I'm like, well, mm -hmm. you're never going to get that made as a movie. So I said, how about a comic book? And you see the result. So we put it together. Oh, there you have it. And I uh, used to mention it. There are different perks in case that you want to participate. Uh, different uh, pin-up uh, covers, different variants. And uh, the, the art, as far as we have checked it, it's wonderful. Um, yeah, it's astounding. We got some great artists. Graham's doing the bulk of the story, but we got Butch Geis. Uh, we've got Kelsey Shannon. We've got some other terrific artists working on this. 
Yeah, yeah, it's it's wonderful, and I was really glad because when we were looking at the perks, uh, some of the most expensive, uh, exp expensive ones were already sold, and it was like uh, people are actually uh, paying attention, and they are actually appreciating all the work that that, that you all you guys all are doing in this. So we were delighted to 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 hear about that. So uh, let's go with some of the questions that we have already prepared. Let's go with Gilberto first uh, because uh, I believe that you uh, have uh, a lot of questions in here prepared. So. I could spend like uh, three days uh, asking Chuck and uh, not running, running out of questions. Uh, first of all, uh, again, thank you. Thanks for having us, sure. uh, joining us. And uh, one thing that came to my attention is uh, usually when the, a writer or an, a, a, a team, a creative team, do something uh, movie related like aliens pred uh, predator and all that stuff it comes under i don't know idw uh, the dynamic forces not like dyna dynamic forces no dynamite even marvel or dc uh, and all because of the distribution i think it'd be i would like to think that because it's easier to get it uh, to the to the stores to the local right. comic shops uh, what uh, what made you make the decision to go to indiegogo as a plat as platform of development and distribution uh, besides uh, the capacity of giving all the perks and uh, i don't know the uh, having the to, to talk with the fans and having a little more uh, personal relation with with them well well richard meyer is uh, kind of a crowdfunding king and um you know i had done a few jobs for him And I knew he was a huge Expendables fan. And so when I got the idea, how about this Expendables comic, uh, I went to Sly first and I said, I explained Richard's background. Richard is a military vet and he's very successful in crowdfunding. And I said, we could get this done seamlessly. And because Sly owns the comic book rights to Expendables, we didn't have to deal with lawyers or any other film companies. Uh, it just took Sly saying, yeah, go ahead and do it. So, um, you know, I, I called Richard and I, I called him on the phone. And I said, um, I want to be sitting down when I tell you this. And I explained to him about the Expendables go to hell. And it was a good thing he was sitting down because he really is an enormous Expendables fan. And um, I, you know, once he agreed to do it, you know, which was instantaneous, uh, I wrote five pages that day and we had art by the end of the week. Uh, we really got rolling fast. We started, I think, in October on this. And uh, we got off to a very fast start. And uh, I've been very pleased by the whole thing, especially the reception. I mean, uh, you know, we, we busted past all of our goals. Yeah, and by far. Gilberto? Yeah, no, go on. No, no, that's the, that, that's the story. No, no, that, no it, that, that's great because it's like uh, Dan said, uh, once you, you come to the Indiegogo page uh, for, for your project, And you start watching and revising all the things that you have to offer. It's not like uh, something that you usually can get on the, I don't know, in a comic book shop or on a sure. I'm on the previous uh, channel, something like that. There's this, this is something very, very specific uh, for the, the tires are are thought uh, in in any kind of particular way for for the fans, or is just something like that that you saw it could fit? Well, it's, you know, I mean, the way these, I, I mean, I bow to I bow to Richard's judgment on crowdfunding because he really is an artist at it. He really knows what he's doing. And, um, you know, he decided how to arrange the perks and how to arrange, um, you know, the extras, you know, the stickers and trading cards and things like that. Uh, I left all that up to him, but, you know, he's a master at it. But what's groundbreaking, what's different about this Indiegogo campaign is this is the first time a licensed property was, has been done as a comic through crowdfunding. And that's a game changer. That's a big deal. And uh, because of the kind of money we were able to raise, and we basically just made a 50-50 deal with Sly. I mean, it was just a clean deal. Uh, he's happy. We're happy. You know, and we're going to keep on doing it. You know, we're going to do some more Expendables projects you know, uh, over the course of the re over the course of the year, just keep on doing it as long as people enjoy them. Excellent. And um, uh, we have some different questions. We will, we will go with uh, Ricardo uh, next. But before that, um, th th there are some things that are uh, characteristics in, in, in the different characters that you have written 
uh, along uh, along the way. And for example, uh, I just love the way that you, uh, you, you you write action scenes. So uh, uh, just looking at in here at the Expendables, it was like a, a dream match uh, came true. That I have to mention, uh, and you you have already said, uh, if you want to check some of uh, Chuck Dixon's uh, previous work, uh, it's really easy. You can just go pretty much go to Amazon, and then, there you can find uh, different uh, uh, hard covers and soft, soft cover. In this particular, is, is the one I believe it based in the in the first novel, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Um, so that's that's perhaps the easiest way for you if you are only familiar with the, with the film to get to get in here and also as Chuck was mentioning uh, in in the page you can go crazy so uh, we were looking at so, some of the variant covers when the, for example the, the one where it's an homage from the Captain America classic cover where well uh, <laughs> Sly is uh, just punching uh, not Nazis but uh, the evil uh, down there so let's go with Ricardo uh, uh, sorry Gilberto you have something no, no, no I, I'm okay all right sorry yeah and let's go with ricardo for the following question okay uh, as you were saying when we think about action we think about chuck indeed uh, he has written everything that has kung fu uh, fights uh, acrobatics uh, he is the ideal writer for the expendables so we think we have uh, heard that uh, Expendables uh, just reached by far the mark for the Indiegogo. Uh, I think it was ten thousand, ten so ten thousand dollars. Yeah. How much have you? Uh, well, we're uh, this. This is the this deal. <laughs> raised like 1500 times the amount of our goal um you know so it's it's been extraordinary uh you know and and you know comics aren't cheap to produce uh but the the you know as the campaign grows you know we add more stretch goals we add more things that, that's what i like about crowdfunding even as a customer you know i i i donate to it and then by the time I get what I donated for, it, there's more stuff. I mean, there's a whole box of stuff. Uh, and that's what we're going for here, that uh, we want to reward the people who have supported us on this. Uh, I'm all for, you know, the more money we raise, the more content we produce. So uh, if, you, if you, you know, if anybody likes the Expendables, if they like action comics, if they like this kind of thing, you know, as long as we have the support, we're going to keep doing this. Hmm. Excellent. Uh, Ricardo, a follow-up question or? No, yeah. Uh, as we heard, uh, you are already writing the sequel of this este, novel? Yeah, we have a lot of ideas. Um, uh, both Graham and I and Richard, we all have different ideas. So we're making plans. We, we we talked about a, um, a like a 24 page one shot and then there's another 60 page story we're talking about and then probably follow that up with an actual mini series or, or another you know lengthy graphic novel like a hundred page graphic novel so uh, like I said you know Sly's been super happy with the work so uh, you know we're greenlit forever if we want to keep doing it as long as we get the support which we've been getting we've been getting tons of support so a lot of people are real happy to see this happen. Excellent. Okay, as, as I see, uh, you are not coming to mainstream really soon. You are very comfortable in that, is to, in crowdfunding now. Yeah, I've always, I've always been, you know, as long as the work is interesting. I mean, these are kind of weird days to work in comics because <laughs> back when I was at DC or Marvel, you, you, you got a title like Robin or the Punisher, and you stayed on it, you know, sometimes for years. And that just doesn't happen anymore. So now um, I'm, I've always been a comic book writer. I've never really wanted to be anything but a comic book writer. But I find myself writing video games, um, you know, writing web content, writing novels, things like that, because it's just a different world uh, for creative people. You've got to be ready to do anything and everything. Yeah. All right, uh, Siko, another question or we go with uh, Daniel? 
Oh, Daniel. All right, let's then, because let, let's not have Sico use uh, uh, accaparating the mic. So, uh, Daniel, you have prepared a couple <laughs> of questions too. So, go on. The mic is yours. Thank you. Um, Chuck, uh, you're very famous for your action comics, but also you write The Simpsons. How you came to, to that family? <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, it, it, you know, every year they would do a Treehouse of Horror uh, comic. And they would invite basically, you know, regular comic book writers to write for it. And uh, eventually they got around to me and I wrote a Treehouse of Horror story. And I really, really enjoyed it. And so I asked them, I said, you know, would you take a regular submission from me? I mean, I'd love to write a whole issue. And they said, yeah, yeah, sure. So I wrote an issue and uh, they liked it and I liked it. Uh, I, I enjoyed doing it. So you know, over the course of like the next 10 years, I, I wrote a lot of Simpsons simply because I enjoyed it. And then <clears throat> oddly, m my wife enjoyed coming up with plot lines. <laughs> She'd say, did the Simpsons ever do this or the Simpsons ever do that? And, and she would give me whole like outlines for plot lines and I began submitting them. That's why a lot of my Simpsons comics are credited to me and E. Blackburn. That, that's my wife, Elma. So, uh, but I, I, I enjoy, I also, I work a lot on SpongeBob SquarePants too. I like that stuff too. I mean, I don't, I don't mind doing the funny stuff and I don't mind doing the kid stuff. And uh, one question uh, just before we go also with Daniel for uh, a follow up question is, do you, <coughs> sorry about that. Uh, uh, do, do you have to, uh, is it easy for you like to, to switch minds when you are uh, working in this kind of different projects? It's like, for example, right now I'm going to write a, a cartoon character or something like that. It's like, oh, I have to prepare myself doing a certain kind of ritual, or it's like, uh, on and off. Yeah, it, it's um, a lot of people ask me that question, and I mm -hmm. think it's best that I don't think about it too much. Because <laughs> everybody <laughs> seems to think it's very, very hard to switch from one genre to another. But it, it's kind of easy for me. And the thing about writing is 90% of it is walking around thinking about it, you know. Uh, so by the time I sit down and actually write, I've got all the ideas in my head. I've got it mapped out in my head. So basically, you know, uh, I finish a story, a Batman story, I leave Gotham and I go to Springfield, you know, or I go to Bikini Bottom, you know, or I go wherever the story <laughs> is. And then I, I'm in that world. I'm thinking about, you know, that world because, I mean, that's what a writer does. They sort of take their mind to another place. And um, for whatever reason, uh, that's not hard for me. And like I said, I don't want to think about it too much because I might talk myself into a problem. So. <laughs> All right. So follow up uh, question, uh, Wookie? Yeah. Uh, have you uh, ever write an um, episode from Simpsons or uh, Bob? No, that's the funny thing about, um, you know, animation and comics. They seem like the same thing, but the animation people do not want the comic book people over, <laughs> over where they are. <laughs> uh, I remember when uh, Batman the Animated Series was on, uh, when it came up, I was working at, on Batman comics at the time. And the animation people would come to New York all the time. I mean, I met all, almost all of them. They would come to New York. And there was a lot of uh, cross-pollination. You know, they, We were taking ideas from them, and they were taking ideas from us. And it was all big, sharing, happy family. And then I found out they were going to do Batman Beyond. At the time, it was called Future Night. Oh, and so I contacted the animation people and said, man, I'd love to get involved in helping to develop that. And they were like, oh, no, no, you're not a cartoon person. <laughs> you're, not, you're not one of us. <laughs> so I was like, wow, I, I thought we were all friends here. And it's like, no, you know, no, you're not part of this world. So basically... It was like, yeah, we are friends, you are not part of we, so something like that. And apparently on The Simpsons, you have to be a graduate of Harvard University to write The Simpsons, and I'm certainly not. Well, <laughs> all right. So, uh, Gilberto, a follow-up question? or um... Yeah, the, uh, there's something that, that uh, with all this uh, talking about uh, what you just said, about... Once uh, there was a time when you were writing a, a book for Marvel or, or DC Comics, and you could be on it like uh, 
I don't know, four or five years. Uh, I just remember that you run on, on Robin, Detective Comics or Nightwing, that the, it was like Nightwing was four years to almost uh, four years, right? Right. So right. something like that. And, and nowadays it's like, uh, okay, you know, I'm the, the power to be and I don't kind of like, I have this idea. And you go to Arno, uh, you, you can say, uh, tell them that you, what you're doing is not uh, on the way or it's not, it cannot be aligned perfectly to what they are proposing. And all of a sudden you are out of, of that book, uh, even if right. you were just like uh, three, months in, three, three months into it. Right. And uh, do you think that uh, all the more uh, recognizable writers uh, such as yourself uh, could be moving? We, we, could, we, will be, we will see them moving to crowdfunding projects instead of working to, to the two main uh, companies? Yeah, absolutely. Because I mean, the biggest thing about, um, and it started with eBooks, you know, people started writing eBooks and publishing them themselves through Amazon and through iTunes. And, and that took away the gatekeepers. You know, you didn't need permission to write a book, you know, which is basically what, you, when you go to a publisher, you're asking permission to write your ideas, mm -hmm. you know, uh, whether they're your own ideas, or, you know, you, you go to the publisher and say, I have an idea for a Spider-Man story well, you've got to get there okay to do it, you know. Um, but now those gatekeepers don't exist anymore, and you can create your own properties and just get them to the public through crowdfunding, through e-publishing, through web publishing. I mean, it's completely wide open. And um, it's just a matter of marketing. And I find marketing boring, so I don't like doing it. Uh, I don't like selling the books. I just like writing the books. Uh, but... But, you know, we, we've all had to learn more about this in order to succeed in this new world. But, yeah, I mean, um, it's liberating, uh, especially when I write my novels. I don't have to ask anybody permission. I just get an idea for a novel and I just simply write it. And, and no one can say no. No one can say change it. You know, it's mine. And, uh, and, 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 and I own it. You know, that's another big thing is to own properties rather than simply work for the companies on things they own. Uh, because, um, you know, there comes a time in every creator's life where the, the publishers go, you're over, you know, you're old, people don't want you anymore, you know, and then what do you do? <laughs> you know, because they've decided, you know, what you're going to do with your life by not hiring you anymore. So you've got to make your own life. You've got to make your own career. And um, a big part of that now is crowdfunding and an ebook and, and just doing things on the web. Yeah. And do you think that it, it's easier for, for people like yourself uh, who, has, uh, who has been on, on this field for a long time and it's pretty much uh, is recognized uh, everywhere that, that you go, that just post on your social network, uh, I don't know, your Facebook, your Instagram, and that solves the problem about uh, Merck? That is just... Uh, just your name or, you see, or your best, uh, your fan base on social networks? Well, when the internet began, that was true. I mean, I could trade on my name on the internet. I mean, I had a, I had a, a website and a message board in the, in the 90s that was huge. Mm -hmm. And then it sort of faded away because um, the new gatekeepers arrived. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, you know, Facebook and Instagram and even Yahoo, even the email services became gatekeepers. Um, if I go on Facebook, uh, I have multiple pages on Facebook. Facebook, I probably have twenty thousand followers on Facebook, but I can't reach them without Facebook's permission. So when I post something, all twenty thousand people don't see it. If I want all twenty thousand people to see it, I got to pay. <laughs> yeah. So, so I would have to pay like $3,000 to make sure my post is seen by everybody. And that's where, to me, social media is a lot. It's not social media. And, and as I've learned through crowdfunding, because I did crowdfunders and they failed. Richard Meyer did crowdfunders and, they, and they're huge. Now, Richard Meyer is great, but I got a bigger name in comics than Richard Meyer. But Richard Meyer knows how to do it. <laughs> I, don't know. Yeah. I don't know how to get my name out there, even though it's known. 
when I first started doing eBooks, my sales were fantastic. And then Amazon changed the rules uh, because they bowed to the publishers and Amazon became a gatekeeper. So, you know, uh, you, you, the, the learning curve, the, the speed at which you have to learn this stuff is so fast uh, that I eventually went to an ebook publisher who now publishes my stuff and I'm, I'm, I'm making a lot more money through them than I was on my own. But when I first started doing it, I was making very, very good money. But there was no one standing in my way. Now, you know, it's like everything else in the world. You go on the internet and everybody's got their hand out. Everybody wants a dollar here, a dollar there. And, um, you know, so the only thing I can rely on, the thing I'm trying to build is, is my email. You know, I'm trying to build an email list co of contacts so I can contact my fans directly, which I think is kind of cool. I mean, if I was a fan of somebody and they were emailing me directly, like this is my new book, I would think that was pretty damn cool. And I hope I hope people think that's cool when I email them. Actually, it, yes, it is. We have every time that you send a message, that you just got a uh, book out, something like that. It's like, a, whoa, oh, Chuck Dixon just wrote me. Uh, yeah, it's pretty, pretty cool when you contact the, the, your fan base. <laughs> I don't know if anybody has uh, some other question. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sico, perhaps uh, I, I remember that you were mentioning a little bit about some of perhaps uh, previous work from uh, from Chuck. Perhaps uh, I don't know if you have a question. About yeah, that. yeah. I think that uh, Chuck, as we were talking, is very revolutionary or ahead of his time. He is always, or he is always seems to be ahead uh, one step. Uh, I remember that when you start uh, writing Punisher, you uh, created Lynn, Lady Punisher, and yeah. then you went to DC Comics and began in writing almost all the Bad Family, but you uh, created uh, also the Birds of Prey. You were ahead of the time. Uh, now it's a boom uh, with superheroines and all that kind. You did it in the 90s, in the early 90s. Uh, how you uh, take this step ahead of all the writers? Well, uh, Birds of Prey was the idea of uh, Jordan Gorfinkel, who was an editor. And uh, he told me that he wanted to do this book where Black Canary and Oracle were teamed up. And he said that they would have chemistry. And is and he came up with the idea that they wouldn't meet. That, they, they, that Black Canary would not know who she was working for. It would be this mysterious voice. And um, it took him a while to sell me on it. I, I really wasn't that interested in it because Black Canary had just had a book canceled. And I thought, well, she's not very popular. Her book just got canceled. But he insisted. And he kept pushing. And recently I asked him why. I said, why did you keep, why didn't you just go to another writer? And he said, because I thought you would get it right. And I, so finally I agreed to write a one shot, you know, a single issue. And six pages in, I went, man, Gorf was right. These characters are perfect together. They, they're, they're so different from each other that they kind of complement one another character wise. And um, so, you know, I, I saw what he wanted and develop the book. But I've always I've always written uh, strong female characters. I, I always like, I, mean, I, I had two older sisters. So I knew, you know, women are tough. You know? <laughs> in a lot of cases, they're tougher than men. And they're also better in a crisis situation because women can be um, emotionally upset and still think clearly. And men can't do that. <laughs> when he gets angry, he all sense flies out of his head. <laughs> I mean, with your rat. <laughs> yeah, it, I mean, if you've ever argued with a woman, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> and they can be angry, but they're still making much more sense than you are. So I've always liked strong female characters. And up here in the United States, I don't know how it is in Mexico, but all I want to talk about is diversity. You know, you know, you got to have, you know, this kind of character and that kind of character and that kind of character. Well, I've always done that. I just didn't think of it as diversity because I was writing, you know, Batman and the Punisher 
are basically ur urban crime stories. And I always populated my stories with the people that I knew lived in cities. You know, all different kinds of people live in cities. And I would always, you know, to make the stories more interesting, uh, populate it with, you know, people of different color and nationality and religion, because I thought that made the story richer. You know, but I wasn't doing it for any political reason or because I thought I was some sort of crusader. Uh, I just did it because I thought it made the stories better. And yeah, I was, you know, I guess I was ahead of my time uh, because that's just the way I thought. I mean, I grew up in a city. You know, you grow up in a city, you know what it's supposed to look like, you know, and feel like. So I wanted to make Gotham believable. Hmm, there you have it. So we're going to go for the final round of questions. Uh, we will go first with uh, Daniel, then we'll go back with Siko, and then we had with Nightboy. But uh, just before that, I'm going to do a... Yes, this will be a fanboy question, so I apologize in advance, uh, Chuck. But I couldn't help but notice that you have uh, uh, some really interesting action figures uh, and collectibles uh, right behind you. You even have uh, different versions of uh, Bane in there. So, uh, fanboy question. If you were going yeah. to, to, to build uh, your, um, your super team, your special tactics team, and uh, you were going to pick some of the characters uh, that are represented uh, right behind you, uh, uh, be careful. You cannot pick different versions of Bane. <laughs> the super Bane or like that. So what would be like uh, three characters that you would pick to write in, in this story? And what kind of story would you be interested in, 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 in saying? Intel. Oh, wow. I mean, I I love crossover stories, and that's basically what you're talking about, uh -huh. right? I mean, just any characters. I love crossover stories because uh, I did I did Batman Predator, I did uh, Tarzan Superman, I did Superman Aliens, Batman I, Spawn. I, yeah, yeah, Batman. I did Batman Predator. I mean, oh, yeah. uh, sorry, yeah. Uh -huh. I used to propose crossovers all the time. So um, yeah, I, I, I guess I'd have to pick Batman. I'd have to pick the Punisher. And uh, man, how cool would a Batman Punisher Bane story be with the three of them together? I think that would be cool. All right, so but no, no Astro Boy. Astro Boy, yeah. <laughs> I don't know how I would fit that in. That might be a challenge. All right, yeah. So sorry about that question. Let's go with Daniel for a more serious question. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. Yeah, right. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> we share that in common. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, Batman, Nightwing, and Robin, all the characters were uh, the best of in martial arts. Do you practice anyone? No, no. I'm I'm uh, I'm a gun man. <laughs> I'm a gun. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I Punisher, kind of. Yeah, yeah, Punisher. I love Pun Punisher. Has always been the easiest character for me to write because I, I I just love that kind of stuff. All right. But yeah, watch watch stuff. I mean, you know, I used to watch the Kung Fu movies, and I'm a big samurai movie fan and all that. So I was conversant with it, but I am no kind of martial artist. All right. Uh, Which uh, your favorite gun? <laughs> Uh, uh, Dan Wesson, 44 Magnum, big, big right. war revolver. That's my yeah. favorite one. All right. if you, and if you're, if, if you look back, you'll see that gun shows up a lot in my work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, let's go with, uh, Sikom. Okay. Uh, Chuck, if you, uh, were able to write uh, something new or propositive in the comics uh, with all the things that are turning around the feminist movements, the, the equal rights. Uh, you think that you could do a null action team with those uh, uh, teams or yeah I, I i mean i think i i think i can i think i have uh i wouldn't have conscious feminist themes though because i'm not real sure what modern feminism really means um it seems to it's too political uh modern feminism um it's it's too uh supportive of one side over another 
and doesn't really seem terribly supportive of women. I mean, I mean, here in the United States, we have all of these transgender athletes, in other words, men competing yeah. as women and uh, in sports. And they only get to do this because they're allowed to say, well, I'm a woman. And, and you see this guy, and he's obviously not a woman, and he's competing in track and basketball and even weightlifting. And it's like where a man has all the advantages. But here in the United States, the feminists say nothing about that. And it's like, you're supposed to be supportive of women. These, these athletes are taking scholarships and positions away from women and they're men. <laughs> I thought you didn't like men. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. And yet you're letting men, you're literally letting boys into the girls clubhouse. And, um, and, and to me, that smacks of political, you know, you're not supporting women on a social level, you're more concerned with your own politics. And I think that's wrong. So I couldn't write a comic book based on modern feminism. But I can certainly write strong female characters. I mean, I, I love writing strong female characters. Uh, and I don't see them as underdogs or damsels in distress. I, I never write my female characters as hostages. I mean, even when I wrote Lois Lane, she was tough. She got herself out of her own problems. All right, let's go with um, uh, Gilberto. Yeah, uh, just as uh, we were talking that the, all the stories and all the characters that you have written along along the time, along the years, uh, is there, I don't know, a story about uh, a character, uh, just say, uh, uh, Nightwing, Batman, Punisher, or even The Simpsons, there's a story that you would like to write yet? Or do you think that uh, your time writing uh, mainstream comics or uh, editorial comics just just say characters with uh, gate, uh, gatekeepers as, as you mentioned uh, do you think that that those days are, are way behind you or would you like to come back to to, or to this world? well I, I i recently was invited to write an eight page nightwing story for a robin special And it reunited me with Scott McDaniel, my Nightwing artist. And that was a lot of fun. And it was well received at DC. And, um, and then right after that, they asked me to write a Catwoman uh, eight pager for a Catwoman special with art by Kelly Jones, who I'd never worked with. We've been friends for years and I've never worked with him. And that, and that was well received. Uh, so I don't know if DC has any more plans for me, but if they invited me to write stuff. But there's always stories that I wanted to get to tell that I never got to tell. So. Uh, yeah, I would, I, I would come back. There's a Punisher story in particular that I'd love to tell. Hmm, interesting. So um, we're pretty much uh, about to finish uh, this particular transmission, but I don't want to, to go away uh, without uh, mentioning some of the questions that we have from the audience, particularly from uh, Juan Spirit, John Spirit, Mr. Spirit. Thanks for, uh, for writing. And um, he's mentioning that one of his favorite books uh, from you is Transformers, Hearts of Steel. And he really liked reading that book again and again. So he, he really loves it. And he has one particular question. Uh, Chuck, when you write a comic about a character that has a certain story, is it difficult to develop a story with it affecting that was previously done? Or are you just looking to create your own universe or particular story? Well, I like to be faithful to the property I'm working on. I'm, I'm not, as far as I'm concerned, I'm not hired to change everything. I'm hired to basically write a story that the fans of that story will really enjoy. And so I want to basically cater to what they expect. I, I want to give them a story in a way they don't expect it, but I want to, I don't want to defy their expectations. If you know what I mean, I want to be true to what it is they love about that property. And the transformers in particular was the most intimidating thing I'd ever worked on because I knew how devoted Transformers fans were, and they didn't want to get it wrong. And I was very fortunate in that the story is set in the past. So I didn't have to deal with any of the continuity uh, that came with the Transformers. I was kind of before that continuity began, but I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed writing the story, but you, but, you know, um, I want to make sure that the, that the fans feel as though they've been respected and I'm not just out to make my own mark. I consider my writing style would be what I call the invisible hand. Uh, I don't want you to think that someone wrote it. 
for someone who's behind it. I'm not there to to um, self-aggrandize or, or make myself look bigger. Uh, I'm there to make sure that the story is as entertaining as possible for the for the fan who reads it. Excellent, excellent. So I believe that uh, that was pretty much everything that we had um, already uh, prepared. Let me check if we have uh, more questions for the audience. Uh, no, that's it. And uh, well, I, I want to uh, thank uh, all of you who have been watching in here, but particularly and especially Chuck. I want uh, we are being really honest when uh, we say that we're really thank thankful for your time, for your experience, because uh, we uh, are really fans. Yes, we we are fanboys of, of a lot of yeah. Of your work. It's something that has been uh, with us from from a lot of time, from from, from a long time. Uh, different versions of Robin, different different version. The, the first version of the Punisher uh, that I read was the one that you wrote about, and I believe that a lot of the members of the audience, and particularly us, uh, who are, who have the chance to be talking with you, uh, we are really thankful for all your your work because even though you mentioned that perhaps you are not like uh, trying to to be the person who is in front. Uh, your style it's something that you can really uh, you can really tell because uh, we know that you are actually paying attention to the story to the characters and that you love them and you share that love for the characters or, and the storytelling to all of us readers of your work so first of all thank you for 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 all your work and thank you for accept, accepting this invitation well thanks for having me gentlemen i really enjoyed it it was a pleasure Mm -hmm. And hopefully uh, we will have you as a guest, uh, not in the so far future. So, uh... No, no, absolutely, absolutely. Give me a call. Okay, so perhaps uh, you heard it in, in here first, guys. Uh, Chuck Dixon is going to be a regular <laughs> for ARMY. <so. laughs> He's the new fifth member. <laughs> we will, actually, yeah, you know, let me let me see. We can send you a dog tag for ARMY, so it will be an honor, honor for, for us uh, to have you among our members. So. Very cool. <laughs> excellent, excellent. And remember that you, if you are watching this, uh, if you want to mo to know more about uh, the work that uh, Chuck is uh, doing right now, the easiest way, well, you can go and find it in Indiegogo. Uh, there is the Expendables Go to Hell graphic novel. Uh, we have been uh, looking at some of the perks. And don't worry if you were going to spend uh, in some of the higher tires. I, I, I saw one that it was in the original art from uh, Mayer, the, the variant that he made. It's 71,000 pesos. It's in pesos. So uh, don't worry. It's already claimed. But that doesn't mean that you cannot help this project. There are a lot of perks that you uh, still can 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 get in there and it ships uh, worldwide and if you want to get in touch with Chuck you can find him in Twitter and you can also find him in Facebook I believe that Facebook is easier uh, for people to contact you right Chuck oh yeah absolutely absolutely I'm always there all right and uh, well you you will see funny pages uh, pictures of dogs and pictures of bats and pictures of everything that uh, he has been working with and also if you like the kind of content that we are uh, doing in here remember that you can support us in our patreon page which is in patreon.com slash destripando don't worry if you are an english speaking listener uh, we will have the links so you don't have to to be dealing with our broken english when we are pronouncing the name of our show and as you can see actually there there you have it that's the the, the the streaming that we were having right now it's already available audio version of this show will be available in in a couple of minutes for our patrons and for special members uh, if you are someone who has been watching this show Uh, and uh, you come from Chuck Dixon, you say that, oh, I am a friend of Chuck and I will send you the link before to our patrons because that's how much we like uh, Chuck and, and uh, his friends. So there you have it. So well, thank you. Uh, thanks to everybody who has been watching this. And uh, of course, thanks to Zico, uh, Daniel, uh, Gilberto, and uh, especially uh, thanks to you, Chuck. It was a real pleasure talking with you. Well, you guys have been great. Thanks so much. All right. And we have them.